I mean, he's cozy. Well, my name is Adam Smith. I'm the director of Culture Week now. It's a huge pleasure to um, welcome you all here to this good uh, Oriana uh, event. Uh, Tim Milkis, who is a very accomplished documentary from this room, has been the driving force behind this. And I think we were first talking about doing this kind of event in 2020. Mm -hmm. Chatting. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, lovely, lovely to be here. Um, I've had quite a lot to do with the Miller Center at the University of Virginia um, over the years, and um, so I'm particularly pleased to to welcome the Miller Center back to, to Oxford. Um, before, before I introduce the, the panelists, let me just tell you a little bit about the, the format. So, we have about an hour and a half. And for the first 45 minutes, I'm going to pose fiendishly difficult questions <laughs> to the panelists. <laughs> and they're going to give fiendishly clever <laughs> answers. And then, and then we'll open it up <coughs> to the floor, just a general, general Q&A. And we've got till about noon, you know, just, just maybe a few minutes after if you need it. Um, so yeah, let me, let me start with, with Sid, since he's the key organizer. And Sid Milkis is White Burkett Miller Professor of Governance at UVA. And he's the author of a very, very large number of books. Um, the, the ones that I use most regularly, Sid, are the, are the three that you co edited on different reform eras in 20th century um, American history, which is when you started when you were still at Brandeis, mm -hmm. I think. And those are very, very useful. Um, series of essays, very, very kind of teachable. Um, and then a very large number of books on the presidency and on presidentialism as a thing. Um, and the most recent one is called What Happens the Vital Center, Presidentialism, Populist Revolt, and the Fracturing of America, which came out just this month, I think. Is that right? End, end of January. January. End of January with OUP. You're welcome, Sid. Um, on my right, your, your left, is Mazita Lajabadi. Uh, Mazita um, teaches political science at Michigan State, but is currently Wyman Professor um, at, at Oxford, at Balliol and at RAI. Um, is going home tomorrow. So on behalf of RAI, I thank you for all you've done for RAI and for Balliol during your, during your year here. Um, Nazita is the works on political discrimination against minorities and is the author of Outsiders at Home, The Politics of American Islamophobia. Um, next to Sid, Margaret Riley is Compton Professor of Law at the Miller Center and Professor of Law at University of Virginia, um, where she directs the Animal Law Program and is also an expert on food, Drugs and public health law. And um, on, on my far left, <laughs> Ursula, well, I'm a long way right. <laughs> Ursula Hackett um, is senior lecturer in politics at Royal Holloway, um, works within the American Political Development School, works on federalism, education, judicial politics, gave a wonderful talk on judicial politics at UCL a few months ago, um, and is the author of America's Vouchers Politics, How Elites Learned to Hide the State. All right, shall we get going? 
Sure. Uh, I'll ask <laughs> no. Whatever. <laughs> why ever not? So, so the first question really is um, really what's new and what's familiar in, in, in the Biden presidency? Has it very strongly resembled um, the administration that Obama served as vice president, or is it fundamentally different? And if so, what are the differences? Do you want to start with it, Tesla? Um, so I want to first say thank you so much for having me here. I think this is a, an important question because I think we see a lot of familiarities. In, in there's, there's a lot that's familiar. There's some stuff that's new. In terms of what's familiar, yeah. well, uh, a lot of the staff <laughs> working under the Biden administration uh, have stayed on in the Obama administration. So you have that, right? You have a lot of the same people in government who are continuing to, to sort of essentially put a lot of the policy in the Obama administration had going for a period of eight years and had those same people operating. You have very similar policies in the Trump administration as well. So I think it's important to see that there was some streamlining of uh, policies with respect to foreign policy, for instance. We have not re-entered the Iran nuclear agreement, for instance. Um, the uh, exit from Afghanistan was a uniquely Trump policy that continued into uh, the Biden administration. And so there's there's a lot that's familiar, right, from two different <laughs> parties uh, that, that's continuing into, into the Biden administration. But what's new? What's new is some allegiance between the Biden administration and black women. You see um, Biden paying very close attention to building a coalition um, of voters that is uh, very cognizant that he has to string along a coalition of minority voters. Um, and in doing so, he's he's quite inelegantly uh, built this coalition. It's, it's a tough one to build, but uh, you know, he's, he's I think, um, quite cognizant that sort of middle-aged black voters are going to be key to and maybe what else is new is, frankly, the disregard of young voters and uh, what young voters need from this government. Currently, young voters constitute um, the same proportion of the potential electorate as boomers. And yet, if you pay attention to, um, for instance, um, the Democratic National Convention, if you sort of had paid attention in 2020, what Biden was who he was bringing to the table and the policies that um, were, being, were being discussed, they were not taking into account that there's a generation of young voters who are frankly being ignored and underrepresented in the United States. So that's something that needs to be talked about. And it's honestly a policy item that is going to harm him likely in the midterms. Student loan forgiveness, for instance. If you paid attention to Twitter, <laughs> you notice that almost on an hourly basis, not just young people, but members of Congress are calling on Biden to cancel some form of student debt, to offer some relief to young people in the United States. Relief has been extended to the rich, the elderly, the poor, but not to this sort of millennial or Gen Z group of people who are burdened with enormous um, debt. So, these are all sort of new issues that are coming up um, uh, currently. And I think, um, yeah, that would be sort of my take on it. Thank you very much. Sure. So um, on what is the same. So I would say that the ACA was the Obama signature legislation. And if we think about that, there is real continuity. That has been one of the focuses of the Biden administration is shoring up the ACA through some of the degradation that occurred during the Trump administration. But frankly, there was no fatal attack on the ACA. And I would say one thing we learned from the Trump administration is that the ACA is likely to be here to stay. The question is whether you can hollow it out. So I think that the Biden administration has been very conscious of this. COVID was actually good to the ACA in the sense that we actually expanded access to many more people or many more people were uh, able to be on, in the exchanges. 
Um, and in just April this year, for example, uh, what we have seen is the uh, Biden administration interested in expanding it through what's called the family gap so that there is even more access. Um, I think related to that, there, are, there is a cultural continuity um, that has been a perhaps, it's certainly a flaw, whether it's a fatal flaw, we'll see. Uh, and that is the notion that competence is enough. Um, you saw that with the, the Obama administration and you see that playing into the way Biden administration has looked at many things, including COVID. Um, and it's not enough. Um, and they're not going to get credit for many of the very competent things they've done with COVID because they've had a very mixed communication and also a misunderstanding of some of the cultural elements of the United States, uh, which became frankly even stronger during the Trump administration. We moved into a real populist notion and also a very federalist notion of looking at how the different states play out. Uh, so if I look at that, um, it's a mixture of both the good and the bad of, of parts of the Obama piece, but also I think we have to remember that the Trump administration changed things dramatically culturally. Um, and that is going to play out throughout. I think if, if at his brothers, you'd see a Biden focusing, and you do see Biden focusing on infrastructure, but it keeps getting stopped in Congress. Um, and so we'll have to see how that all plays out. I think, I think there's gonna be a bit of a walloping in the midterms. The real question to me is how that plays out to the, the presidential election in 2024. Sorry, Margaret, how, how different is that, um, that, that sort of, one compared to the desire to govern kind of pragmatically competence against the, the idea of a sort of sharply partisan political culture, uh, especially on Congress, then, I mean, didn't, didn't, Presumably, Obama has an almost identical experience. He's just started trying to make deals with. Yeah, I, I, it may be identical, but I couldn't imagine passing an ACA now. Yeah. It could not happen. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, it barely happened yeah. in 2010. Um, and in, in many ways, one might argue that that's what started us on the pathway we are now. Starting in March 2010, we we ended up in this sharply divided area, um, and, and healthcare in the United States has major cultural elements as well. Um, so I think that Biden has a, and of course he's got COVID. Um, he has a much more difficult landscape than we had in the beginning of the Obama administration. Um, so, so I don't know that I could say that it's his fault, but yeah. he's going to have to live with it. Yeah. Well, maybe that's something we can discuss a little bit, bit later. Is the, is the uh, you know, maybe because because Trump is such an extreme in, individual, it's tempting to believe that he completely remakes the political landscape. And maybe he did in some respects, but it's also the case maybe that he's a he's a beneficiary. Of I think so that he always gets to get. So maybe. That's something we can think, yeah. think about a little bit, a bit further. Thank you very much, Margaret Hirsch. Yeah. Um, well, let me take this to another person, a sort of broad brush um, uh, 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 view, but also to pick up on some of the points that you and Margaret have made already, especially this point about learning. I think that's really crucial. We're thinking about some of the similarities and differences between the Biden and the um, Obama administration. But I think certainly in terms of the economic context in which they assumed office, both coming out of economic crises, you know, unemployment rates high. Um, uh, I think facing opposition Republican intransigence in Congress, um, uh, and also you mentioned 2010, I mean, certainly the sort of the big midterm shellacking being a huge moment that shapes and that continues to shape uh, the politics at the state level, but also, um, I think, uh, across the board. Um, and I think also we, of course, see continuities in terms of some of the policy priorities. I think certainly the attempts to try to um, uh, 
uh, forge more diverse appointments. And I know Bob Biden has been extraordinarily um, successful in, in, in nominating women to some of the sort of appeals court positions and things. And so really, really committing to that in a way that I think much, that far exceeds that Obama. But certainly in terms of that orientation, I think that that commitment to that coalition. So there are those similarities, but I think that I absolutely agree with Margaret. There is a, a substantially more difficult landscape that Biden faces, partly, of course, because the man comes to office in the aftermath of um, a Republican effort to uh, overturn <laughs> that, that Democratic victory in 2020. I think we have to sort of start there. That has to be our starting point, this, this effort that, you know, that, what is it, 148 odd Republicans that, that refused to certify Biden's win, um, Donald Trump attempting to overturn that um, uh, that result and advocating violence, um, culminating, of course, in that January 6th um, riot um, insurrection. And um, so I think that's huge. That hugely shapes the Biden administration. Um, I think that uh, there are one other difference that I see, and perhaps this is more of a, um, this is where the, I absolutely agree that there is there are these enormous difficulties that the Biden administration faces. Um, certainly, there's, it's a far more polarized context, I think Gareth mentioned this, than it was even during Obama's time in office. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the average Senate uh, Democrat is far to the left <laughs> than the left of the Democrats that were, that were there in Congress during Obama's time in office. Okay, so we've got this great sorting, we've got this polarization, but there are the one thing I do see on the part of the Biden administration is learning about the, the, the depths of that intransigence for part of the opposition about that you, know, you saw, for example, in the Biden administration, those efforts to reach out again and again to Republican opponents within Congress and trying to work with them, trying to achieve some compromise. We have seen some of that with, with Biden, but I think that certainly with respect to the um, uh, sort of efforts on infrastructure and so on, they, they have one meeting, they think, right, we're going to go to reconciliation. This is the moment we're going to try, we're going to have to bypass this because we understand that um, we, you know, this isn't going to be um, a successful route for us. I think there's an understanding also about the importance of going big with some of these initiatives. Um, stimulus, for example, two and a half times bigger than Obama's um, uh, you know, cash payments as well, $1,400 um, for people, very visible. Um, and I think that there is, there, there is some learning that has taken place over that time uh, between the Obama administration and the Biden administration about what is um, what is possible within this very, very difficult political environment. And, environment. Um, and, but I, I think I also see policy differences as well. I mean, I, I focus on education. I mean, it's interesting to note um, with respect to the Obama administration, they had this leverage extraordinary change in the educational arena through a very unusual set of circumstances, which was that the No Child Left Behind law was due to reauthorize and, it being, and Congress had failed to reauthorize it for about seven years over the course of much of the presidency. Um, and so they were able to leverage the waivers um, to this law, that these sort of incre increasingly onerous requirements that No Child Left Behind forced upon states and localities um, in terms of uh, getting 100% of children proficient um, in reading and writing by 2013 to 14 you know, we, we, we face increasingly failing and being able to leverage extraordinary change on the back of that. But at the end of Obama's um, time in office, what you've seen is the culmination of a backlash from states against this, what is seen in many quarters as federal overreach, and it culminates in the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which explicitly prohibits any future Secretary of Education from doing what Arne Duncan and Obama have been doing for the whole of that time. So, so so there is a there is a closing of a window of opportunity. I think that the Obama administration really leveraged in that particular policy area, um, uh, 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 and that I think constrains the capacity of future administrations to achieve that sort of policy, those sorts of policy changes in that particular area. So anyway, there's, there's lots of more things to say, but I just thought that in broad brush, I, I see I do see a very difficult environment, but I also see learning about what it takes to actually do some do something within that within those difficult circumstances. Yeah, these are all great comments. I don't know if there's anything left to say. <laughs> just, a, just a couple things though. To, to pick up on this question of confidence, I, I think a, a bad turning point for the Biden administration was Afghanistan. And if, if you look at the trend lines, that's where things really uh, began to go south for him. The Omicron thing really accelerates that. But his argument that he was going to be more confident than the previous administration took a serious hit there, yeah. uh, I, I believe. 
and, and the, uh, the point about judges, I think, is, is really important because, as we all know, Joe Manchin has become the bete noir uh, of the Democratic Party. But you have to realize, I don't know why this isn't obvious, without him, there's no majority there's, with, with Vice President uh, Harris. There's no majority uh, in, in, the, in the Senate. Uh, and this is a guy who's elected. It's a, it's a miracle to have a, a Democratic senator from West Virginia, right? Trump won 68% of the vote every county in, in West Virginia. Uh, and, and so the attacks on Joe Manchin, it seems to me, are, are, a little, are a little overwrought because without that, you don't get nearly as am, ambitious a COVID law as, as you were talking about, uh, Ursula. And you don't get all these judges. Uh, I think Obama appointed, appointed 42 judges in his first year which is a record. You don't get any Justice Jackson uh, without that, uh, without um, Joe Manchin. Um, so uh, one of the things the Democrats have to uh, confront, and, and you suggested this in comparing him to Obama, is it's a much more fractured nation. Uh, and it was very fractured under Obama's presidency, but it's a much more fractured nation now. And even though the Democratic Party is more liberal, than it, I mean, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are really out what is a very liberal party with a with very strong progressive caucus uh, in, in the House. But even with that, the country is much more divided. And in the face of that, uh, in thinking about Obama and Biden, I think, I don't psychologize politics too often, but I think there's this kind of rivalry <laughs> between <clears throat> the two. And this was, uh, I think, demonstrated an interesting way when Obama went back to the White House to, to celebrate the signing of the Affordable Care Act, and o Obama referred to him as Vice Pre President Biden. And I don't know if that was, he meant to do that or, or as a Freudian slip. And if it's a Freudian slip, well, there's still something there. Right? It's, not, it's not just by accident. And, and I think in, 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 uh, in spite of how much more the, the nation is fractured, I think Biden's program is much more ambitious. Uh, than uh, Obama's was. And in October, he went towards Springs, uh, where Roosevelt, of course, bathed in the therapeutic waters and said it was time for a new New Deal. Uh, and if you look back at the Build Back Better program, it is extraordinarily ambitious. It's got, uh, it's got programs in there that one would associate with, with Denmark, the family uh, tax credit, for example. Extraordinarily generous and, and something that I think uh, Senator Bernie Sanders would be, would be very comfortable. But pursuing that kind of program in the face of this fractured nation and the, and the enduring uh, afterlife of the Trump presidency, I mean, Trump's pre uh, dominance of the Republican Party is really extraordinary. Uh, I mean, I don't know the history of every president who lost, who lost an election, but I don't think there's ever been one where the party worships him uh, in the way that, that Trump, after losing every, every, um, every uh, institution, in the, in, the, in the national uh, government, losing the presidency, losing the Senate, he's worshiped uh, and, hanging, and hanging there and still questioning, um, still questioning the legitimacy of, of, of Biden's uh, of election. Today, there's gonna be a very important uh, primary in Pennsylvania uh, for the Senate governorship. I don't think there's a Republican candidate who's willing to claim that Biden uh, has won the election. So in the face of this ambition clashing up against this, this really, really polarized country. Uh, I, I think it's not surprising that Biden, Biden had a rough road. Maybe you could keep short, okay? For the second <laughs> question. I'm ready to get off. <laughs> so, um, I mean, in your book, Sid, you, you used the phrase, uh, um, cold city. Mm. The, the, the US is in the middle of a cold civil war. And I wanted to um, ask you all um, how you would characterize the Biden administration's, well, first of all, how you would define that, and second, mm -hmm. how, how you would characterize um, Biden's response to the cold civil war. Do you want to start? Uh, sure. Uh, but uh, that's not my term, but it's a term no. that, that I, I, I think it's interesting it's been used because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I always, uh, tell my students, you know, this isn't the first time we've had polarization in, in the country, um, right? We've had many, almost every period of major change in American politics. The country has been badly uh, polarized. Uh, and the most uh, dramatic example of that, of course, is, is the Civil War. Um, and, and we had a, civil, <laughs> we had a shooting Civil War 
Um, so the fact that that's the parallel, political historians and political, historically savvy political science regimes, that's pretty disconcerting. And, and so what it means to me is that both sides view each other as an existential threat to, to the country. They don't view the opposition uh, as, as legitimate. Um, and, and I think what, what adds to this polarization is that, um, that the country is, uh, is split geographically. So we have red and blue America in, in each, uh, which, which accentuates this kind of, 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 of deep uh, uh, polarization. And, you know, Biden uh, promised to restore the soul of American politics, to be a uniter rather than a divider. And I think there have been some efforts in, in, in doing that. I, but I agree with Ursula that there was not quite as much as there was with the Obama uh, administration. And I think, again, going back to this pursuing a new deal, um, um, and, 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 you know, I'm not blaming the, pol the accentuation of polarization on Biden. The Republican Party has been extraordinarily intransigent. Uh, the filibuster is used routinely in, in, in American uh, politics. But, but I don't think you can, you, uh, you can say that Biden's done everything he can nor, nor should you say perhaps that he should do anything he can to heal that, heal that polarization. Do you, so, do you think the new, new New Deal is that primarily an effort to kind of just change the conversation, so to deal with this cultural civil war by just talking about other things mm -hmm. that are potentially a bit less divisive? Yeah, I think there, there's a, a I know there's arguments in the Democratic Party about what to do about economic issues yeah. versus, uh, I hate the term identity politics because yeah. I don't think it, it, shows, it, 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 it shows enough se uh, respect yeah. for how important uh, those kind of issues are, race, ethnicity, uh, sexual identity. Mm -hmm. But there's an argument going on right now in the Democratic Party. Some people say you have to emphasize economic issues to win back the blue power workers that were one at the core, were once at the core of the democratic coalition. And of course there's a, there's a, there's powerful forces, particularly in the progressive caucus mm -hmm. to say that one can't ignore the coalition that got us uh, mm -hmm. elected here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this idea of build back better is, a tr is an attempt to try to reconcile mm -hmm. those things, pursue a very aggressive, really something that des deserves to be called democratic uh, socialist program mm -hmm. that will uh, benefit, I think, uh, disproportionately disadvantaged groups mm -hmm. in the United States. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think I pick up on something that um, Sid was talking about there, or several things that Sid mentioned, which I absolutely agree with. And one of these, uh, that, that is to talk about the, the general the consequences of this polarization. I think we're absolutely clear about what we understand by polarization. We're talking here not necessarily about issue polarization, at least in the public, um, and there's been a lot of commentary recently in terms of the war, about abortion, because of the least where we weighed um, opinion, um, that people are actually relatively, the, the public are relatively moderate on this issue, and most people are not too extreme on this thing, but certainly in terms of affective polarization, and the, the degree of conflict extension, the degree to which these identities, racial and otherwise, are aligned along partisan lines in a way that has not been uh, the case for a very long time. And the degree to which this is driven by activists as well. Um, but these, these are the continuation of, of, of trends that have been in place for quite some time. And I think all presidents have to deal increasingly with that, those, that polarization. I think that there are several consequences of it. As Sid mentions, the routine use of the filibuster as part of uh, lawmaking. Um, Francis Lee and Jim Curry have got a wonderful book um, about Congress and, and, and in particular what they call unorthodox lawmaking, the sort of sense that that becomes a routine uh, the routine use of these um, uh, these various procedures to try to achieve some uh, legislative um, success in this system that is that is that is increasingly difficult to navigate. Um, so that's part of it. I think that pushes uh, 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 the action towards the executive branch, and it pushes it into an authoritarian mode. I think it pushes it towards executive orders. I mean, Biden has passed an extraordinary number of executive orders. Um, far exceeding those of his predecessors, many of which were re revocations of previous executive orders. I mean, rejoining uh, uh, or preventing the withdrawal from the World Health Organization, Paris, and so on, the things that the Trump administration has done. Um, I think fully half of the, if I'm remembering correctly, of the executive orders that he passed in the first uh, uh, year were revocations of those that had been put in place by Trump. 
So there's that, I think, is a consequence of that polarization and the, and the stereotypism and the challenges that Congress has faced. faced. Another thing, which I, this is close to my heart because I work on state politics primarily, it pushes the action to the state then. Because, the, you know, although, of course, we understand American politics to be increasingly nationalized in lots of dimensions and lots of ways in terms of how people understand their vote choices and so on, and in terms of that, those sorting processes, um, I think that so much policy action occurs at the state level. Um, and I think that there, we still see the consequences of that shellacking in 2010, when Republicans swept to power in, across so many state legislatures, um, uh, they still have 30 compared to 17 on the part of the Democrats in terms of the, 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 the number of legislatures that they're, they're controlling. Um, there's very few that are actually, relatively few that are split control. Um, the, the Republicans still have an advantage at the state level, and that has policy consequences that have consequences in terms of uh, the appointment of judges and the justices who are going to be um, deciding upon these, the, the constitutionality of these programs of policy. Um, and it has consequences for gerrymandering, of course, and for the, the uh, uh, alignment of electoral boundaries in those states where legislators have some role in the process. Um, and it has consequences for the pipeline of talent for people working their way up to sort of federal office who, who, who are, you know, who are, are cutting their teeth at the state level um, and then are going to go on to office in the future. So I think that, you know, the, it is extraordinarily important that Republicans control uh, uh, more of these state uh, state houses than the Democrats do. And I think that one thing that the Republican Party has done so well over the course of the past, you know, decade and a half or so, is that they have invested in that state and local ground game, that sort of grassroots effort. And I think that Democrats are, are, you know, are sort of facing up to the consequences of that. And I think that if what, what, what the Democratic Party needs to do, I think we're going to talk a bit, hopefully, in the future about 2022 and then talk about the 2024 and maybe the sort of the, the time frame. I think that this has to be a, a medium to long term effort. I think that this, these things don't happen overnight. I think it's something that that, that investment needs to take place over a long period. Uh, and then you start to see the payoffs down the road. So, um, so I, I didn't I haven't talk, talk directly about polarization, but I think <laughs> that it certainly pushes action, as I say, to the executive mode, to the authoritarian mode, but also to the states. Um, and that's where a lot of the action is. Yeah. <laughs> very, very quick follow up, Ursula. So, is state level politics as poisonous, polarized as federal politics, or is, is it actually easier to get stuff done at, at the state level? Not just because of raw arithmetic, but just because it's less Yeah, I mean, it's certainly easier to get things done in a lot yeah. of places, and I think that's that's certainly true. I mean, partly it's about the, the sort of constitutional context. I mean, the state constitutions are far more uh, amenable to uh, amendment. Um, I think that um, there are um, the, the sort of um, uh, just the, the fact that there is unified control um, in many of these mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, jurisdictions allows a greater degree of policy latitude than was the case with this finely balanced, razor thin margins at the federal uh, level. Um, you just don't see that sort of routinized, super majoritarian uh, uh, requirements um, uh, as well. So, so I, no, I do, I do think that it is more. I don't know about poisonous. No, um, it's more, <laughs> more about numbers and institutional <laughs> characteristics. Than I, I think that I think it is easy. It is easier. It is easier. So that's that's where the, the policy yeah. action is shifting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, esteemed colleagues here, I think you've said said quite a lot that we've learned from. But I guess the one thing I would say and add to this conversation is that you know this cold civil war that we seem to be finding ourselves in um, certainly exists along party lines. But as Sid had mentioned, um, there are racial and ethnic cleavages that are running parallel. We cannot ignore that and that feed into the party debate. Um, we see this realignment across racial lines um, where I think it's gotten to the point where in some of these areas across the country, there is perception that other racial and groups posing a potential threat. Like you look at what just happened in Buffalo, you know, um, the type of uh, rhetoric that presents itself in the manifesto. The the perpetrator points to Trump um, in, in the discussions. Um, it's radicalized based on what elites are saying, and so I don't think you have racial divisions without um, paying attention to what's happening in. in politics. And so, you know, I, I guess I also agree that, you know, the term identity politics is 
quite productive, but it, it certainly exists. Um, and, and there's certain positions across racial lines that we just simply can't ignore. Thank you, Patricia Margaret. So I won't add that much more either. Um, I'll focus on the New Deal piece. And one thing I think about that is it is a conscious but not fully successful attempt by the Biden administration to win back the white working class voter. Um, but what it ignores is how much some of those racial cleavages play in the voting preferences of different parts of the public. So one might argue um, it creates polarization in the sense that you have the Reagan dismantling of the New Deal. Um, and so you have the traditional business part of the Republican administration reacting against this New Deal and doesn't actually address this issue of, um, of how we could, we're going to deal with those racial cleavages. Um, so I think it's hopeful that it was intended to be hopeful. And in some ways in the beginning of the administration because of COVID and the necessity to pull things in, they were able to get things through Congress that looked like the New Deal. But we are now in, in definite gridlock. Um, on the executive order side, I, I might say that uh, certainly Republicans would argue that Obama started it. Um, it was a reaction to congressional gridlock in the Obama administration. And we now have both the Trump administration, Obama administration, or all three, and Biden administration resorting to them and ending up in the courts. It's going to be a really interesting question of how solidified executive power is with those, those uh, reactions. Um, and, and the courts are really struggling because the more conservative sides were willing to increase that executive power during the Trump administration, but seeking to dismantle it during the Biden administration and how that plays out in actual doctrine is really questionable. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. At this point. Thank, thank you, Margaret. Um, so, I'll ask you all about the midterms. <laughs> um, so, like the President's party nearly always loses the court, and part of me is wondering whether this year could be another, um, to borrow from Ursula, shellacking. <laughs> um, you know, Not since sort of 19, <laughs> <laughs> 1938. <laughs> You know, 1994, you know, really seismic or upheaval. Um, yeah, yeah. And what sorts of things Biden and Democrats can do to sort of mitigate that? And whether judicial politics might change the story? <laughs> I get to go first. Great. Um, <laughs> So to get us started, uh, I think there will be some version of shellacking. What I am still struggling with is how much the leaked uh, Alito opinion is going to play out. So here's my, my hunch. I think the shellacking continues in the House because there is such gerrymandering of districts that you're going to see base voting and those base votings are going to be exacerbated by the economy. Maybe things will improve by October. I think the electorate is amazingly responsive to change. So there could be possibilities, but it's not going to change enough to, to deal with the deep red and blue districts we have in the house. Um, in the Senate, it could play a role. And here I have something of a view as a Virginian rather than a view straight on national politics in that we always have this experience of the Virginia governor's for, uh, election right after you have the presidential election. And it gives you a sense of where, where things are going. Um, and what I would say is in the... Virginia election last year, you saw Democratic women in Northern Virginia staying home. Or to the extent they were not staying home, they were somewhat colored by education politics and the notion of woke effects on education. 
it is possible that the leak or whatever happens in June uh, with Roe v. Wade is going to wake up Northern Virginia, the, the so-called soccer moms, as we used to call them. Um, and that could have a profound effect on the Senate because then you have state elections playing a role, the whole state, and these very gerrymandered uh, districts don't play the same role. So it is possible, although, you know, things like Fetterman having a stroke um, in Pennsylvania have, have an effect on this. There's the, the bad luck or good luck things that, because we're really on a knife's edge, but it is possible that effect will, will play out and that you could have Democrats holding the Senate, which is gonna be crucial for the Democratic agenda or in judicial agenda. Um, but it's also possible they lose both. And the funny thing is, I think even if they lose the Senate in a very narrow fashion, mm -hmm. it will be viewed as a shellacking uh, because any switch is gonna be viewed as a shellacking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and on, on the House, and, and sticking with Virginia, so if you have someone like the Congresswoman Spanberger, mm -hmm. who can represent Louisa County, and Brian Ballard's district, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, people like that, or is a guy called Lamb in Western Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. yeah. so he both represents a fairly culturally conservative district. Is there any kind of capacity for Democrats who really really pay attention to local sentiment in, in the district to, to sort of transcend national well, times. Speaking of Spanberger, her district was redistricted explicitly to actually add in some blue votes. And I do think Ukraine is going to play a role for Spanberger because mm -hmm. of her uh, national security mm -hmm. experience that, that she can speak to that very effectively she and it will play a role. Yeah. yeah. Um, on Lamb in Pennsylvania, I don't know enough uh, what I would say, but it, it's, I think some of these um, mixed districts or, or close to mixed districts, and, and New York just had a, a, a judicial uh, ruling that's actually changed. So you do have some, some yeah. districts in play. Um, it will all turn, I mean, this is traditional, you, you political scientists know it's better than I do, it's gonna turn on the economy in October. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. I don't see us having real opportunities to have significant economic change. Mm -hmm. Ukraine is going to continue, gas prices will continue to stay high as long as you look at gas prices in the US over, over $4, which is, yeah. um, I think that's going to promote a shellacking. Well, I guess I, I sort of see the midterms as a turnout game. Um, it always is, right? So it's going to be substantially lower in the presidential election. But I think um, for Democrats, you know, if you sort of have a bird's eye view of things, um, they're probably going to lose more voters who they need to be a part of their coalition than they would have in other election cycles. And um, why is that? It's not just because, um, you know, people sort of become more disengaged uh, during the midterms and start to find things, et cetera, but because there's been a series of policy failures. Um, I think that in terms of immigration, abortion, voting rights, um, issues that matter to young people, um, Afghanistan, inflation, the economy, I mean, you name it, there are so many issues that not all in the presidential administration's control. Um, but that have manifested that the arguments um, for keeping people home are numerous. I don't think they would vote for the other side, but as you all sort of know, the turnout game is not just a turnout game, it's a stay at home game. And so I think there's a lot of ways in which people who are sort of necessary to the coalition of voters to at least not undergo a shellacking. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the uh, Democrats will lose 62 seats. I think they lost 60. I can't remember if it was 62 or 63 in 20, 2010, which was the worst defeat uh, since 1938 because the, the majority is so slim, right? So um, usually a president brings more of a majority into the House. Yeah. 
than Biden did, but it's only going to take what five seats when they lost the House, and I think uh, it, it certainly looks like they're going to lose more than more than five five seats. I I think as as Margaret was suggesting, the major issues are, are going to be uh, the economy, law and order, and parents' rights over curriculum, which was really a huge issue in, in the Virginia campaign. Yeah. Critical race theory. Um, mm -hmm. I was a student did her honors thesis on this and did a study of every curriculum uh, in Virginia. Nowhere was there to be found <laughs> critical race theory. But in spite of that, the, the issue is, is a very powerful one. I, I, yeah, our, we have great, great honors yeah. students. <laughs> some of my colleagues can certainly uh, attest to. Uh, I do think the, um, the abortion issue could have an effect because it's uh, it, the, the turnout in midterm elections is lower, 40% uh, is high. So the base voting is very important. And this is an important issue yeah. for the base. So the so-called enthusiasm gap, which is, I think, real, that might be narrowed somewhat, particularly with, with young people uh, who, who, as Sheeta pointed out very rightly, are, are really disenchanted with, with the, the Biden administration. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I think they're going to lose. I don't think it's going to be as, but it's, it's going to be as dramatic as past shellackings. But as you say, Margaret, if they lose the House, that's that's a huge thing. I think we have to watch the Senate uh, and see what happens there. The, the Democrats are defending a lot fewer seats, mm -hmm. and they're not defending any seats in states uh, that Trump won. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the Republicans are defending a lot more seats, and two of them are in states that Biden won, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. So, uh, and I, I think there's uh, four states one, one should look at, uh, um, five states in particular. Uh, I'm, never good, I'm never very good at math, but it's four or five. You guys tell me when I list them. So, uh, <laughs> you pick out here. Uh, so, Nevada, uh, Wisconsin, Arizona, uh, New Hampshire, uh, and uh, what else was that? Five. New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Nevada. So that, that is five. Yeah. 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 <laughs> five, or, five or six. Yeah. So, those are. Those are really key states, right. and I think it'll be really interesting who gets the nomination for the Senate in, in Pennsylvania. So there's this, I don't know if you guys have followed this guy, it's John, crazy. what's his second name, John, uh, John oh. Fetterman, John Fetterman, oh. six foot eight, campaigns in shorts, <laughs> <laughs> and his With football jersey, and, and he's running against Connor Lamb, so it's just really oh, interesting. Okay. Two guys who are sort of trying to, yeah. run, uh, and, and uh, Fetterman's particularly running as an economic professor. Uh, and, and not a social conservative, but he has that that appeal, that innate appeal. Uh, like he, he campaigns in bars mostly. That's one of the more that's one of the more dignified <laughs> campaign, campaign stops when he when he and of course holding on to the Senate is huge because that's where the judicial yeah. appointments are made, and uh, and maybe there won't be an opportunity to appoint another Supreme Court. Uh, justice, mm -hmm. but the low, as we know, the appeals courts and the district courts mm -hmm. are very important. So I think losing the House, but we really have to look at the Senate yeah. very carefully. That's true. Yeah, and I have several things to say on that just to add to what Sid was just saying there. I, mean, I think um, it is true that some of the vulnerable Democratic incumbents in the Senate are, they do, so there's a great analysis in 538 where they were looking at the base partisanship in each state and mm -hmm. how those incumbents perform relative to that base partisanship, like how people sort of you Republican the Democratic Party more generally and, and they all all of those vulnerable incumbents in many of the states that you mentioned there said they yeah. outperform the base partisanship yeah, yeah. and there is a serious possibility of flipping Wisconsin as well. So they're kind of when you get down to brass tacks, mm -hmm. there are routes forward for the for the Democrats with respect to the class three Senate class. They have not got that. 2024 is going to be dreadful for the Democrats. They, yeah. They've got a terrible map. So it, you know, the map matters. I mean, when, when you get right down to it. So I, I really don't, I wouldn't be confident making a prediction about the Senate because I think it really is going to come down to these little, these individual races and, and what, what happens in those, in, those, in those particular moments. But I think that um, I'd absolutely agree with all of the rest of the panelists who've been saying this is about mobilization. This is, this is, you know, the, the, there's been all this hysterical commentary about the, the, the Roe v. Wade leak and its possible effect. It's, you know, it's not going to change anyone's minds, guys. I mean, like, we're all really, you know, Americans are pretty well sorted on that. I think it, it does come down to exactly as Margaret said, the college educated white women, like, where are they going to turn out or are they not? I think mobilization is going to be really important because, as we know, differential turnout is what shapes midterm election uh, results. I think the question in my mind is about the relative importance of all these things in, in what these were saying. It's a really crowded field here. I think the economy, historic 
uh, inflation, terrible gas prices. They're saying that they're going to stabilize, but it's still going to be really terrible. So I, I just, you know, even when you set that against kind of lower unemployment, higher job, you know, all this stuff that just gets drowned out in the kind of general cost of living kind of, you know, uh, crisis, frankly. Um, so I, I, I just, I, that, what, that's what gives me pause because I think, well, mm. on the one hand, there may well be a mobilizing effect on a lot of this sort of cultural, cultural things, not only abortion, but also I think the question about, you know, whether they can, whether the Democrats can say, look, these guys, you know, these, our opponents are talking about, you know, trying to ban books in your kid's school and making, yeah. you know, and, 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 and dealing with these issues about trans rights that affect like less than 1% of, of kids and, you know, mm. making it without and not focusing on the economy. So that is a potentially powerful messaging strategy yeah. but whether that cuts through when you've got you know we know that under unified control that's when the midterm uh decline is greater historically for the president's party if there's unified government that you know they, they suffer more um and, and also just in the context of this just just appalling level historical historic levels of inflation i just i just don't know whether that cuts through yeah. um, um and, and so i you know I'm, I'm kind of a pessimist i guess actually mm. certainly with respect to the house perhaps also with respect to the senate yeah. Yeah. this turnout more about 35 percent return is that yeah. right between yeah. 20, 30 and 40. <laughs> <laughs> 40 <laughs> moved up a little bit yeah. Yeah. and one thing trump did is enhance interest <laughs> in, in politics yeah the base so, comes out so in 2018 i believe it was up to 40 40 yeah. percent Policy and automotive astronomical high yeah, rates compared yeah. to prior years in 2020. Yeah, I think in addition to suburban women, you right. really yes, yes. That, that's one and of the things that really. Well. And yeah. 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 We'll have to watch and see if Biden cancels student loans. October. Wow. <laughs> 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 and that, they put a lot of the progressive, congressional progressive office. Yeah. Gave him a long list of things after the Build Back Better didn't pass that he should be unilaterally. Yeah. Top of the list was student loans. Climate and then that. <laughs> that was fine. <laughs> fine too, but yeah. yeah. All right, I want to go to Q and A. Are there any issues that you all want to put onto the table that you think we ought to talk about? Uh, well, I'll, I'll raise one thing that we haven't talked about, yeah, which yeah. is remarkable, <laughs> um, and, and I think that um, it could color the election. Okay. And that's COVID. It's, no, it's okay. remarkable right. how, oh, yeah. how little we have about COVID. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I could imagine, um, just based on biology, that we have a surge coming in October, November. And the Biden administration is going to be really struggling at that point what to do about it. Because we're all over COVID. There isn't a mask in this room. Well, there there's was one. one. one um, God bless her. <laughs> uh, we flew on the plane. COVID was done. And, you know, no one had masks on on our plane. Um, and and yet COVID <laughs> isn't done. And if we have a bad variant and the Obama, uh, Obama, the Biden administration is struggling what to do, my hunch is we certainly don't go to a lockdown. But anything they do is going to be divisive. Yeah. And it could it could swing every one of those Senate races. Mm, um, and so that's one sort of, I don't know what's going to happen, no one does, but it could have a, ma a major change. Yeah. So um, I, I should have done this earlier as welcome people who are watching us from afar, or at least not from the room. <laughs> and um, Adam is, got his eagle eye on questions <laughs> via Zoom. So um, I'm going to ask for a couple of questions from the floor, and then Adam, I'm going to ask you to feed in maybe a couple of questions from the Zoom chat. So who would like to go first? Yeah. Yeah, we uh, this information and discussion. Why okay, but keep it quick, yeah? I think I'll go mine in a second later on. Uh, thank you. So just just make your point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we're, 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 we're wasting this guy's time. <laughs> it's all of America. So in all the stories so of American politics, we have to have economic conditions that improve, and in order to do that, we wish to come to some loans. When do you get money? How do you do it? And how do you do it in a differential manner? And also the with the discuss before. Very good. <laughs> Stop <it down. laughs> I think there's um, some discussion happening. There's uh, been some research done actually about the authority of the president to do it. Um, it was actually ordered during the Trump administration. Um, the I 
idea would be that uh, it seems like the report that was just conducted with the Trump administration, my understanding is that um, lawmakers are asking for this to be declassified so that they can go look at it. But their impression among those who sort of know about it is that it is totally within the executive authority to do so. Um, the thought is that uh, by making this type of resource available to um, to make to making canceling these loans to sort of spur the economy because all of a sudden you have frankly a generation of people who now have to not make thousand dollars of payments a month on student loans um, that they can go and spend to buy houses and to you know put back into the economy um, in terms of is, is it affordable well it was affordable to you know cancel PPP loans and uh, all other types of loans and so when the United States wants to they, they can have a way to do it. That's great. I'll leave that to the experts. Can I ask though whether, I mean, are, are there any kind of deficit forks anymore? Are there any fiscal, <laughs> fiscal conservatives or conservatives oh, do what early life? Oh, I think you'll see it. Um, yeah. As we approach 2024, I think you'll see DeSantis rediscovering his yeah. deficit yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um And he's incredibly proud of what he's done in Florida, which is, I would argue, being a deficit hawk oh, with, wow. with a populist streak. Interesting. Um, and so I think we're going to see that play a major role, uh, not in midterms, um, but in 2020. So this is fascinating. I want to ask you about something that hasn't been raised, and that's the role of the media. Mm. Um, I don't recall well enough what the, what the perspective of the media was towards the end of the Obama administration, but certainly the media was, you know, had uh, was very much anti-Trump. Um, whether that's for good or for bad reasons, I, I don't I, I don't want to speculate. But it seems like the media is, is now very much anti-Biden, right? The media has taken the role of the the loyal opposition. Uh, regardless of, of what the policy is. Um, and and I, I think about this in the context of, of this comment with regard to inflation. You know, the, the media is going to report that inflation rates are at record high, gas prices are at record high, but they don't do the math and show you inflation adjusted gas prices. And if they do, we're not at record highs, right? Mm. And so it seems, uh, what I'm wondering is, you know, what role does the media play today? And did the Trump, did the Trump administration move the needle on the media from reporting to the media now wanting to be an active player in uh, the American political dialogue. Isn't Trump being allowed back into his cabinet? I think that's pending. He's, okay, the, so we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Because yeah. right? there was some really interesting research that's all about the, the, the use of um, the consumption of online partisan media and its, and its role in eroding trust in mainstream media, but also eroding in trust in, in, in political institutions and politics more broadly. And so I think that's absolutely part of it. And I think that that, that is being supercharged in the course of the Trump administration and, 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 and into this administration. So I think that absolutely plays a role. And I think that, I mean, that's what, that's the, that is the basis upon which the economists downgraded the United States democracy to flawed democracy back in 2015, right? Mm -hmm. That it was eroding trust. That was the, that was the, um, the, 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 the sort of litmus test that, that they, they uh, reduced levels of trust, and that the, 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 I mean, I suppose also more broadly, you know, a lack of shared reality about what, um, uh, what is at stake, uh, uh, and so on um, within politics. I think that the, the media and the, the sort of partisan media, in particular, has a really real role to play within that. So, um, yeah, I think that, I think that these things are these are. I'm not really answering your question, but I, th I, th I think we have to set it against that backdrop of, of eroding mm -hmm. trust. Um, and I think that those trends are only going to continue um, and to continue to shape, shape politics. Yeah, I, I think, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go. I was just going to say quickly, I think this is a great uh, question, David. I think this decline of trust is deep rooted and it goes back really to the 60s uh, when you really get the development of an anti-institutional kind of, of press. And of course it's accentuated uh, at certain times. Um, and uh, I, I think there's also this notion in opposition that there's an equivalence that one has to be as hard on the right as the left, even though there may uh, parties may not be e equally guilty in certain problems that, that, that plague the country. For example, uh, the, the coverage of Trump versus Hillary Clinton and the emphasis that's put on Hillary.
we put his email. Remember that? <laughs> Doesn't that seem quite now? <laughs> we put his emails, but they were putting as much emphasis on that and all these things that this was provocations that that were part of the the, the, the Trump uh, campaign. Uh, and there's been very little. Uh, I think you're right. There's been very little attention. To it. And Biden has accomplished some really important things. There's been very little attention. I don't know that the general public knows anything about the infrastructure bill, what, what's in it, how it's, how it's being uh, implemented. I think uh, Ursula's last point that the emergence of social media has really sharpened the edge of media coverage and made it much more partisan. And one of the um, paradoxes I, I noted studying the presidency, and this goes to the, the importance of executive orders in a, in a gridlock country, um, is uh, so, so the party in power is all for the president. The party, those who, who do not, are outside the president's party uh, are, are very much opposed to, to presidential power. So my, this thing I've been struggling with to figure out is the whole country loves the presidency, but half the country hates the president. <laughs> and and, and I, I think the, uh, uh, the social media and the kind of anti-institutional approach of even the more conventional established media, I, I think, expresses that. What's Biden's point? Forty-two. You know, in Ukraine, it hasn't stuck. And Bill and I talked about whether this kind of crisis yeah. can help Biden. And so I think it was up to forty-three. So, to, but you have to temper that by saying he's almost as popular as Trump right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you yeah. look at their favorable, unfavorable rates, yeah. I was looking, almost I was the looking same. at figures, <laughs> yeah. figures for Obama, and it was like very up and down. But there were quite substantial periods of his presidency was right. down. Well, yeah. Maybe I was going to say the opposite. There were substantial periods of his presidency when he was about 50% quite right. substantially. And, and well above 60 in the honeymoon period. Yeah. Biden was that would never, be unimaginable now, wouldn't it? Yeah, Biden even with the so-called honeymoon period never went but I think it's 52%. Yeah. Um, Margaret, let, let me add to um, and steal, frankly, my uh, colleague from Miller Center who taught me this, is one of the lasting legacies or, or what really captured Trump was his understanding of how to use ratings. Mm -hmm. and what he really cared about. Mm -hmm. um, this is not unique to me. I give the credit to my Miller Center colleagues. Um, <laughs> but it's an interesting question because the media fed right into that, and it's a lasting legacy if we look at it. Um, it's played out with COVID. It's played out with every step of, the, of Biden's presidency. And I don't see that going away. And, and it's not even dependent on social media. It's very popular to go after big tech and social media, but it's mainstream media mm -hmm. that has fallen into this as well. I just want to call on Adam first, if that's okay. Well, um, the, the, the question is still pending from the, um, the online uh, audience is from Richard Johnson, although oh. he, he posted this question earlier in the discussion and, and we all, we all. You, you, may, you may feel that you've already answered it. So I'll read out the question anyway. What, what is, is about the Alito decision, um, the, oh. the, the, the leaked uh, decision, um, what impact um, do you think it will have on the parties in the terms of the, of the Biden administration? Yeah. Can you come back to that? Yeah, I'd like to hear what Richard had to say. <laughs> Richard, 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 Richard could definitely add to what we Richard, ask another question. <laughs> Good to see you, Richard. <laughs> Telegram <laughs> So I am, I think Ukraine plays an interesting role here. I, I have seen um, a, a change going on. When McConnell went to Ukraine, that creates a divide between the Rand Paul and the more Trumpist parts of the Republican Party and the more traditional business sector of the Republican Party. 
if that continues, I think it may be hard for a Trump uh, candidate, unless, depending on, you know, there, there are some states that are so red, they'll just vote against Democrat no matter what. Um, but in the current landscape, I think it's going to be interesting to see it because it's going to affect turnout. Um, and I don't know what's going to play out. That's just started. I mean, Trump's had an extraordinary degree of success in terms of the, the primary um, uh, 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 candidates that he's endorsed have done extraordinarily well, right? I think he just recently had a had a had a had a, had a failure, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but it, there'd be it was, like a run of was it Nebraska? Forty. The Nebraska, yeah, 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 I think so, yeah. So, like, so, 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 but I don't. This isn't an important question, but I think you're right. I think it comes down to um, the con the consequences of you know. That, that, that war that is currently being played out between the Trumpist mm -hmm. wing and the establishment, what we might understand as the establishment wing of the yeah. GOP, um, and, 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 and what happens as a result of that. So yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how many anti Trump Republicans are going to survive? Like that Lynn Cheney, has she lost her seat? Lost yeah. Her seat? I don't think any. I mean, I'll be surprised. Five or six. Yeah. Although uh, Kemp in Georgia was way ahead of the primary, now whether he will be elected. Yeah. Vice President Cheney's going to campaign. Yeah, how, how that, that, that plays out. Yeah, I think it depends on, on the issues. I think. So people are really focused on this inflation thing. Uh, the fact that the Republicans, Trumpist, I don't think will really matter. If these other excesses, excesses come into play, particularly on the social issues, yeah. then, then it may, uh, in, the, in, the, in these swing states, it may make a big difference, like Pennsylvania and even Missouri. I, I think Biden's new line is, don't think of me as, don't think of, of me as the almighty. Think of the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> That's the winning line. Yeah. That's Biden's line. And, and so that may work. It's a really good question. Yeah. On, on that note, I saw bumper stickers in Charlottesville against me in 2024. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like Biden could have won an open a landslide in France. <laughs> Zelensky <laughs> went to win a landslide. But I wanted to ask about um, how, how you all think, or whoever will answer, uh, Biden has handled the tensions that are in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Some of you all, or some of you are in the progressive mm -hmm. caucus and voter base, um, like moderates. Uh, you know, Biden's instincts were way back from moderate, but the party has shifted. The country, the country was more polarized. Both right and left have shifted. And so he's got a, a big problem, both within the party and his external pressure um, of the Republican electorate on, on the party. So, um, complex problem. How do you think? How do you just as good as you want? What do you think he's done? And then how have you? How do you think he's done? More than what he's done in Trump. Anybody? Cool. Want to go? I mean, I think the thing that's come out of some of the conversation already, this isn't going to add anything new, but just to summarize some, some of the things that I think have come out of the conversation so far, and, and that is this, this point that Lisa was making about um, this administration casting itself as an ally of black women and of being committed certainly to the, symbol, the symbolism of, 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 of um, uh, more diverse cabinet appointments, more diverse uh, judicial bench, um, seeking to expand representation in that, in that, in that sort of um, a descriptive way, and I think that, um, but a couple that I think that you made this point as well, which is that, that there is there is a, a story here of policy failure on behalf of that coalition as well. So actually, you know, I feel like I should pass <laughs> back to you. <laughs> so just, that's, that's a bit unfair. <laughs> but just you know, I, I think that's an interesting juxtaposition that maybe came out of some of the comments that you made earlier that maybe bear yeah. upon this question. And I don't think Oliver should try to give the answer you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, yeah, because I study these groups, right? And, um, you look at sort of what mobilized them and, and uh, they were it was more of a um, anti-Trump uh, mobilization than it was a pro-Biden mobilization um, and I think that very early on there were signs that the Biden administration would would not really be catering to their needs but I think there was hope um, that some of these issues would be would be met um, I think the Biden administration is paralyzed. Um, you know, if you sort of just listen to what Biden's chief of staff is saying about why, for instance, there's no progress being made on the JCPOA, 
it's because they're afraid of the midterms. You know, they're really terrified of losing white centrist middle-aged voters. That's that's the demographic that they really want to keep. Um, and so they pay far less attention to everybody um, at the outskirts. The problem is, is that there's so much more variance <laughs> in the ideology of the average Democrat than there is among the Republican voters. And so it's a tougher coalition to put together. Um, and there's a lot more policy demands um, that are being made, I think, on the Biden administration. I also think that, um, you know, among among uh, these sort of various subsets of this coalition, you have sort of almost a blatant disregard of the progressive caucus that happens among not just not just by Biden, but among by predominantly Democratic elites. I mean, you saw Pelosi sort of really treat the <laughs> the um, the four you know minority women who treat the the squad. Uh, quite quite negatively at the beginning of their term when they you know in the year of the woman they sort of all came in 2018 they came to power and but that block of, of progressives in not just national elections but frankly at local um, elections is rising and it's getting uh, more and more solidified and so you know I, I think that part of this is about the democratic party where before it seemed like to have any real policy impact the view was that you had to sort of pay your dues you had to sort of stick around for a long enough time to be able to have power and then sort of exert over the democratic agenda. And I think that's really changing because we're operating in a world that actually Donald Trump quite understands, which is we have social media, you know? Um, savvy young progressives, savvy older progressives, they know how to go public. They know how to reach um, a broader uh, subset of, of people in, in States and to really share that, that policy agenda. And so all of a sudden, people who maybe were uninterested in politics beforehand now are interested and unhappy. And so, and so these have brought in really complex dynamics um, and challenges, I think, for the Democratic elites um, because they, they haven't quite understood or updated that their way that they play politics needs to change. Can I ask the panelists about um, the relationship between elite opinion and mass opinion. So you, you mentioned, Nazita, that um, the Biden administration is, is pursuing sort of white centrist voter. And is, is that like looking <coughs> for a go-go or something? Or do they actually still a Who was the Republican um, who made an appearance at the DNC? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. remember it happened. It happened. Yeah. There was like an ad. By it was um, a guy. White. It was a guy from Ohio. It was a guy from Ohio. What is <laughs> it was that guy's name? Kasich. <laughs> thank you. Right. Thank you. So that's thank you for exactly being here. <laughs> thank you. My memory. So, like, I think that's that's key, right? You just sort of look at what who was given power, right? You have a finite amount of time that you can uh, use during the convention to sort of advertise who you are and who you want to bring in and and who's welcome. Kasich <laughs> was was given a ton of airtime. I mean, that's like that shows you. That's so symbolic of of how the administration is terrified of of losing out on these centrist white voters who they think have sort of they're, they're sort of sitting Republican, but they can take away from Trump. Yeah, so, so I do think though that if, if you look at what they're looking at, they're looking at Michigan, they're looking at Wisconsin, where their margin was those white centrist voters. Yeah. And they're, they're thinking, it's again, um, there's no alternative. Um, and, and that's where I think the leaked opinion, or frankly, the final opinion uh, that comes out in June may play a role where you suddenly have, it's not just abortion rights that are at stake. There are, there are lots of other privacy yeah. rights that are just long tail there. Um, and if if you look at the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, looking at those issues and suddenly threatened by them and having no alternatives, I think that the Biden uh, strategy looks pretty smart because they have to vote 
and they've got to bring in this white centrist voter mm -hmm. um, to win. Um, now, if they don't get the progressives to turn out, that's a whole different issue. If I can just say one more thing, so Paul Primer had um, some work out in the late 90s where he sort of opined that black voters were a quote, captured group. The Democrats saw them as a captured group. That no matter you know what they did policy-wise, black voters had nowhere to go. They do have somewhere to go. They stay home. And I think that is the thing that we need to think yeah. about. Yeah. Well, no? And more of them voted for Trump. 2020. Among all minoritized groups, there was a larger share of Trump support by 2020 than there was in 2016 yeah. across the board. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think, uh, John, um, the Democrats are, are a more diverse coalition than the Republicans. The Republicans have kind of become a movement party. I think the movement side of the Democratic Party has become stronger, um, but there's still a, a substantial, moderate, pragmatic uh, wing. And that has certain advantages so that uh, if we didn't have the Electoral College, the advantage would be much greater. So I think the Democrats have won the pop popular vote in seven of the eight last presidential elections, I'm pretty sure, which has never happened before in American history, but lost <laughs> two of those uh, presidential elections. So there are certain advantages to it, um, but the disadvantages is the management that the president has to perform. And we do have an executive centered party now. Uh, has become much is, is much more complicated, I think, for for better and worse for Democratic presidents than for Republican presidents. And the same kind of awkwardness, um, discomfort that Biden's displayed, Obama displayed the same thing. Yeah. Same kind of. Yeah. Right. Go back. Something that happened in the Republican primary that I think is really interesting is that the Democrats were able to What 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 uh, Biden might do to to counteract the, to, yeah, uh, you know you can do some things I guess unilaterally he's done you know I'm not an expert on these things but he's he has um, banned uh, some some kind of uh, auxiliaries to weapons that makes them easier to fire and fire more quickly I think can't remember what the term ghost is. Guns. The, what? Ghost guns as well. Yeah, ghost guns. Thank you. Yeah. It's a good thing I have people here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, um, but I don't think, for example, he could ban unilaterally automatic automatic weapons. There was a law in place for that. It that expired, so. right? It was not. It, I think it expired. There's so many more guns already. Yeah, I, I, there are far more guns in America than there are people. Yeah. So, what difference does it make if you stop the yeah. yeah and there's a big supreme court gun coming up yeah yeah so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah so i don't know that gun control is going to do it and you know i understand the slogan defund the police i understand the, you know the profound uh, crisis that the black lives matter movement was addressing but it, it's been a disaster uh, for the democratic party and nobody's complained more about it that is on record it's she feels it's really like fabric excuse me <laughs> my uh my uh my, my uh, flight, flight uh difficulties <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty extreme but could, could, yeah. could one in principle still win a national election by appealing to a median voter who's basically centrist were it not for the fact that the two parties are are, are captured by. Yeah. I don't think there's enough centrist voters. No, so, so public opinion so, polls reveal yeah. that there has actually been yeah. a mass polarization. Yeah, yeah those, those gray beards of us are red bounds, you know, Anthony <laughs> Downs, <laughs> economic <laughs> determination. Of, of, that that bell shaped curve has, has changed quite a bit, I think. Adam Smith. A question I'm going to venture the prize. Um, Jim Jordan Um, AARP, I guess that's the American Association for Science Survey, shows that 
only 17 percent of us women aged over 50 had decided to have their own in november wow wow mm -hmm. uh considering how far examination is what are your thoughts regarding why this group are apparently so uncertain I think you should mention on women because actually older women are amongst the most pro choice on the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's kind of, it's, they are the most liberal on that area, which yeah. is an interesting thing because it's not, that, that is generally, we think about young people as being, young, uh, younger cohorts being more liberal on these issues. It's older women, it's those who are member of pre row world that are potentially most motivated perhaps to, to, to mobilize around this issue. And, and, and that's a very interesting, striking figure. I, I, I wonder where that was drawn. But I bet you it was done pre leak. Yeah. Yeah. Those demonstrations last week were really impressive, yeah. I thought. Yeah. I think I read an article yesterday that said that in, in Virginia, that um, it says maybe it was in the post, but that um, like 45% of voters wanted abortion laws to stay pretty much as mm -hmm. they were. 25 to 30% wanted them to be more liberalized, and actually, a very, very small percentage. Yeah, yeah. Actually, wanted to be more small. Yeah, I turned off my phone, it's still beeping. Adam, that's the Now you're happy for them to be somebody else. That's very cheap. <laughs> um, I get it. Um, uh, Dick, Dick has a Does how do we get out of the cold civil war? Does mm -hmm. one side have to win? Good question. Mm -hmm. I want to look at what happens in Texas. Mm -hmm. I think Texas is going to what tell you us. Cheer us up. Yeah, um, because there's all sorts of migration into Texas that's taking place. Texas has a lot of electoral votes. Mm -hmm. um, if you ended up shifting the state house in Texas, that would have a, a, a major impact. And I think there would be effects that would actually extend mm -hmm. out of Texas within that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know other than that kind of change. I, I sometimes joke that Democrats just move 40,000 people to Montana, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, but <laughs> force migration. Yeah. 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 People in Missouri. We don't, need, <laughs> we don't need as many people in Missouri. Maybe we should. Then. <laughs> but but I do think that's where we're going to start seeing some of the shifts. I think we need to look at Texas. We need to look at Arizona um, and see how there's and it mm -hmm. could go either way in my view. Um, but that may tell us where where we're heading. Mm -hmm. May I have one more state? Please. I think Michigan is a great state I to think look at. Right. So um, Gretchen Whitmer is doing, I think, a fantastic job of healing what are incredibly stark divisions mm -hmm. in the state. Um, and I think that there's a lot of lessons that can also be traced. Yeah. yeah. How in fact, more immediate. I mean, I think if you look at the fact that her life was under threat, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the capital yeah. was sieged. And the way in which she responded to them without sort of making it so sensationalized yeah. and so polarized, where she worked to sort of stay on track and get the job done and focus on COVID. I think a lot of people didn't give into the hysteria of polarization, to be honest. You know, having just, I lived you know, 15 miles from the Capitol and just to be in that close proximity where things just felt like they were going to fall apart, but then that it all kind of held together mm. was really remarkable. And I think it's her messaging to the public that instilled a lot of trust in her, uh, her confidence. So is she a rising democratic star, would you say? I think she would have made for a really good vice president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very happy she's our governor, so. <laughs> say any thoughts? Yeah. Can I just question? get, yeah, because I think, I mean, what you're sort of, you're, you're perhaps it's, and it, perhaps what you're asking is really, you know, how does one, how do we, move beyond this this intractable scenario of polarization, frankly, because what you're describing is a cold war. And I think that there's some really interesting research that tries to address that question in various ways. But I think they address it at very different levels. And I think what we're, we're talking here about macro developments, institutional developments, I think that's the hardest place where this sort of uh, change could be said to occur. I mean, you know, shift over into Montana. But there's, there, there are, there are um, uh, uh, 
sort of scenarios that have been explored through experimental research and other um, research in political science that explore this at the individual level or at the level of the sort of policy scape and the policy makers questions. And I, I think those levels are perhaps most promising. I think at the individual level, there's some really interesting um, research that's been published in, in APSR and elsewhere recently that considers the conditions under which people might be depolarized in terms of their affect towards the other side and the sort of individual psychological mechanisms that might underpin that and how you can expose people to um, uh, 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 information and messaging that, is, that can shift, that can have meaningful, long-lasting effects on people's attitudes towards the other. Um, and so I think there's some sort of micro level stuff going on at the individual level. But I think there's also a broader story here to be told about the policy scape. And I think it comes back to the point I was making at the very beginning about learning about what it takes to achieve any kind of policy success in this, this situation that is very is extremely challenging and mm. obstacle strewn and super majoritarian in lots of ways. And that is a, a, one of the things that we know from the, the Obama administration, but also many other administrations, both Democratic and Republican, have embraced is the sort of submerged tax expenditure driven privatized delivery mode kind of complex obscure kind of really challenging to get your head around kind of policies where it's you know people people don't have a sense of what state people don't have a sense of what government does there is a there is a concomitant um, reduction in trust in those democratic institutions and also an understanding of what you know what, what's going on and, and that is demobilizing in lots of ways so there's and, and that i think helps to fuel parts of polarization because it, it because it opens up a space in which people's Sort of partisan lens can can shape people's attitudes and behaviors and, and, and information becomes you know, challenging to, to acquire and to and to inform one's uh political behaviors and attitudes so i think that there are things that are done in terms of it's sort of, again experimental research that's done on policy and how you can design policy in such a way that people are made more aware of what is at stake and how uh, you know, and, and, and perhaps give credit there's, there's always a democratic bent to these things. It gives you credit to government for what it's done, type thing, um, and, and, and what it continues to do, and, and then thereby perhaps influence people. So there's sort of micro level stuff. I mean, I, I think that the, the broader macro sort of institutional context, I think is, is a much, much heavier um, task. And so I think my answer to your question really is, is that it, it, how do we exit this cult of war with difficulty? <laughs> um, but there, there are things that, 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 that are being done that I see little green shoots where people are, are making these efforts um, uh, uh, to try to understand how, how we can how, how some people can be can be depolarized. Yeah. But if I could just um, add from a very different coming at it from a different direction, is that if I, if, I, if the past is prolonged, it may very well not be. We haven't we haven't resolved past periods of polarization through bipartisanship. One side is one. The Civil War, of course, being the most dramatic example of that. And, and the more peaceful resolutions is by drawing new people into the political process. So I think two thirds of the new voters in 1936 voted for Roosevelt and, and the Democratic Party, uh, for example. I think what's what makes it particularly difficult to break this log jam is that since the 60s, the most fraught issue of American politics has become a, a core issue in our politics. That is race and, and ethnicity. And also, we also have all these, these battles over identity uh, right now. These have always been a, a part of American politics, but since the 60s, they've become uh, a, a much more a, a, a dominant uh, fault line in the American uh, political system. And that's going to be diff more difficult to, to, to resolve. And usually these things, I think about generational change. Uh, there, are, there are massive demographic changes going on in the country. Young people think about politics, even conservative young people, differently uh, uh, than, than generations before them. But demographics are not destined. And, uh, one, and Trump really proved that by drawing all kinds of new people into the political process who before felt they, had, they didn't have any, any part of it. Uh, but I think we were talking about base elections and mobilization. I think that's going to be the key to resolving contemporary American politics. And if the Democrats can mobilize all their potential supporters, they may become uh, the majority party, but the Republicans proved in 2020, they can appeal to groups that one, were once thought lost to the Republican party, Hispanics uh, and, and uh, people of color. How much so this populist message is something to watch, I think. How much of a, a generation gap is there in U.S. politics. I think Britain's huge. Yeah. So I think it's pretty only, only about twenty percent of people under forty yeah. are support conservatives. Yeah, particularly on issues like gun control and climate change. Those climate are, change, uh, women's rights. Yeah. You just look at how 
people by okay. a generation vote or, or rank the most important issues in this country today. Mm -hmm. They're just massive different issue arenas. On that note, um, thank you for your questions. Um, thank you to people in the virtual audience for your, your questions too. And um, I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking our panelists. For